Welcome to the Public Sector Marketing Show, a podcast for government and public sector marketing professionals who want to level up their digital marketing and social media knowledge, skills, and strategic thinking. And now, welcome your host, Joanne Sweeney. Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the Public Sector Marketing Show. Today, we're talking about long-form content and the fact that that it isn't dead. Now, if I got a euro for every time somebody said to me that long form content was dead, then I wouldn't be standing here and hosting this show. But I am, and I am committed to convincing you that people want to read more, listen more, and watch more. So content is the sweet spot between your goals and citizens' needs. Content is the bridge that builds public trust. Content is the reason that citizens act to embrace policy and legislative change, and content is king, and long-form content is queen. So coming up in episode 18, it's time that you gave your citizens a reason to listen. Why I recommend long-form content each and every time for my clients. I interview Alan Mulrooney. He's head of communications at the Western Development Commission right here in Ireland, promoting living, working, doing business on the wild Atlantic way. And I've been watching the work of Alan and his team very closely over the past six to 12 months. And I asked him on the show because he and his team epitomize why long form content is alive and well. What if I said to you that you could get 30 minutes of attention from your key target citizen grouping every single week? Would you want to know my strategy? Well, in today's column, I'm making the argument that you need to give your citizens a reason to listen to you. Whenever I open a discussion around social media being mainstream media, I immediately get backlash and I completely understand it. Um, And let's think about the the journalists thinking uh, in this instance. Journalists are very precious about their content, their storytelling, their features, their columns, their reporting. And of course, they should be because they're trained in their discipline. They are experts in reporting and sharing the truth. And most of the time they get it right. I'm also a qualified and former practicing journalist. So I also espouse to those ethics. But the thing about the digital age and long form content is that you can now be a journalist within your own organization. You can be a social reporter. You can be a feature writer, a profiler of individuals, a host of your radio show and also of a TV show. We live in remarkable times. We now have access to channels for absolutely free to espouse the narrative and the stories and create those emotional connections with the public so that they take a step back and they give us time, attention, and they listen. Because the battle right now online is not for reach, it's not for impressions, because you can get that. The real battle right now is for attention. And attention meaning somebody listening to your 30 minute podcast, watching to the end of that 15 minute video, and actually having a long read of that article or white paper or that blog post of 1200 words. It's no accident that we're seeing mainstream media introduce the long read the week in news wrapped up in this video, and even hosting their own podcasts, newspapers and television stations hosting podcasts and radio stations going into video creation. Why are they doing that? They're doing that for attention and to really get a deeper engagement. The other thing about long form content and giving your citizens a reason to listen is that if they're interested in a topic, They're already searching out a place to have that long read, that long listen, or that long watch. Just go to Google or YouTube after you finish watching this episode and put in a long tail keyword, a series of words or a phrase related to what your department does. 
and then have a watch at what surfaces in the top five results on Google and on YouTube. And you will see the number of people on the YouTube video in particular that have watched that. That is your evidence that there are people interested in going niche and going deep on topics. So if you want the public to listen to you, and if you're a huge critic of social media and clickbait and people not really understanding the the decision making behind a policy or a piece of legislation or a project, then really you should ask yourself, are we giving our citizens a reason to stop and to listen? Level up your digital skills by taking our diploma in digital marketing, plus gain an industry qualification. Use the code Digital Marketing Twenty for a twenty percent discount. Visit PublicSectorMarketingPros.com. Apart from delivering training to public sector pros just like you, I often spend my working weeks working on consulting projects with clients, and more often than not, I recommend engaging in long form content. The reason that that is, is that long form content gets to the heart of the why of your message. And long form content is probably going to answer the who, the what, the where, and the when of that topic also. So creating content that emotionally engages with an audience has to go deep into a topic. We know that headlines and that clickbait exists and short social media posts and they're great to get attention but that should only be the beginning of the story with long form content we are going to the heart of an issue we're also creating an archive for our website but also for the internet so after you publish and optimize and share on social your long form content it then exists right across the social web and it creates a great history lesson of that topic in that moment. So just don't leave those long form content pieces to journalists or to bloggers or to other subject matter experts outside your organization. Really insource your story and own it. There are three types of long form content that we focus on. So it's text, it's audio, and it's video. And these have been around forever as long as we've had media and communications. But now we have the ability to slice and dice and to reach much more people as we share that long form content right across the social web. It's almost like an omni channel approach. The other thing that you have to consider is how you present your long form content. And so what I would do is the first thing is to undertake keyword research. I want to understand what people are already searching for, what questions they have around your key topics. That will allow me craft messages and format and package content to bring it closer to that audience. There's also some great tips here. Did you know that articles that are over 1,000 words long get actually more link clicks and shares than those that are under 1,000 words long. And that's no accident. Google tells us that the modern consumer and citizen is curious, demanding, and impatient. They want to go in for the long read, the long listen, or the long watch. So start taking responsibility for the messaging and ask yourself, how are we going to prepare and present content that is going to get the attention and also the understanding of the public. Some great tips here, but I have 20 in the blog post associated with this podcast as to how you can create long form content that is guaranteed to get engagement. The first one is list posts. People love a list post. In fact, BuzzFeed, the website, was developed on the back of the listicle concept. So, what is it? Well, really, it is a list article. So seven ways, three things that you can do, 12 methods of, it's a list. And of course, by its very nature, the headline gives you a promise and then the article delivers. Why posts are really important, and I think these are a nugget of gold for government and public sector. 
All you have to do is have a look at the questions that the public or indeed the journalists are asking you in media interviews and take those questions and answer them in your why posts using long form content. How to posts are hugely popular. How to is one of the most searched terms on the internet, in search and on social. And of course, if you go to YouTube, you can really find out how to do anything. So if the how to method is one that will work for your department or organization, I definitely recommend that you lean into it. And then, of course, you can repurpose all of these long form posts into videos, explainer videos, animated videos, piece to camera videos, interviews. There is no end to the creativity that you can inject into your long form content. But the takeaway from this consulting segment is the battle for attention is real. You can get reach, you can get impressions, but what you really want to get is dwell time. And you want people to watch, to listen, and to hear and to read the why of your decision making. A one-stop shop digital marketing and social media resource. Join our membership academy for 12 months. Access a library of how-to videos, template strategies, and organizational policies. Monthly live coaching. Attend webinars with subject matter experts. Meet and network with public sector pros from across the world. Use the code MEMBERSHIP20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com. I'm very lucky to have Alan Mulrooney, Head of Communications at the Western Development Commission in Ireland, joining me in today's show. What they are doing with long-form content is a great example of how you can really build authority, build attention, and convert engagement and reach into real action. So I hope you enjoy this interview. Alan Mulrooney, thank you so much for joining me on the Public Sector Marketing Show. Thank you very much for having me. So first of all, tell us about the Western Development Commission and the work that you do. Of course. Um, the Western Development Commission was set up almost 20 years ago. Um, base headquarters in Balahadreen and Roscommon, but we do have staff peppered around the whole region at this stage. Originally, it was set up, I guess, during a crisis of the West. Um, and we've gone through a number of those crises since. Um, the organization is made up of different teams. The first one is the, the fund team, so the Western Investment Team. Uh, that's a 73 million euro investment fund focused on uh, all of the counties in the Western region, helping companies to grow and scale. We can get into that a little bit more if you want uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we separately have a policy team, and that policy team works really closely with our department and with the wider government to, I guess, refocus and tell the story for what's happening in the region to make sure that the government is aware of what's happening on the ground and also to advocate for the West West of Ireland, because as we all know, there's been a, a lack of investment across the board for a long time. So one of the things you may have seen from our policy team in recent uh, weeks and months has been the work with NUIG Galway on the remote working. And that's been, I guess, the biggest remote working survey or surveys done since the pandemic uh, kicked in. So that's been that's been really successful. Uh, outside of that, we also have a number of European projects. Um, and there are six uh, live European projects at the moment, ranging from... Um, uh, tourism to uh, biz mentoring to um, uh, projects that focus on the recycling of uh, fishing nets and, and waste waste fishing, uh, which is really interesting. And they work with European project partners based in uh, universities and ITs across Europe. Um, we also then have the Atlantic Economic Corridor project, um, which is something the Western Development Commission has been asked to, to lead out on. And that's led us to a big hubs, hubs project, which I'll get to in a moment. And then I guess uh, last but not least um, is, is the communications team, which is the newest part of the organization because there wasn't necessarily any comms on board, even though the organization was here for about 20 years. So that's headed up by me. And then I've got two staff members who work really closely with me at the moment. So from a crisis in the West to what I would describe as a rebirth and a resurgence for the love of the West. Now, I can say the West is best because I'm from Donegal and mm -hmm. I live Galway and I've never lived too far from the coastline um, but how has digital marketing helped you guys really communicate your messages because it's a complex organization it has a huge remit um, and so obviously you need to be very strategic to get those messages to land and to deliver those results. 
Yeah, no, honestly, it was, it was a, I guess, a challenge when I first joined. I'm with the organization almost two years at this stage. I joined from IDA Ireland. So my background within the regional development perspective was looking at FDI coming into the country, focused on the west of Ireland. So I understood that element of it, but there's much more to the Western Development Commission than the west of Ireland. So we began at the very beginning, which was um, pulling it all apart, looking at the organization from a brand perspective, what worked and what didn't work. Uh, how are we speaking to our audiences, looking at our multiple audiences, and there are lots across the board. Um, so I think about two or three months into my to my job start, we were um, knee-deep in a rebrand, which probably took the guts of about eight or nine months, longer than, than probably anticipated, but a lot of work done with the boards, a lot of work done with our managers, our departments to make sure that we were going to be on message. And then we looked at other Parts of the organization, for example, lookwest.ie, which was a separate organization that we had for the Western Development Commission. Um, and, and we decided to bring that back in under the new Western Development Commission brand under a living section. Um, once that was done, we had a new brand, a new website that was best in class, a new logo. It was then time to start building content to reach those multiple audiences. So as you know, it was really about mapping out where we reach those audiences, what they do in their daily lives, where they live online, what social media platforms that they use, and how they consume content. And um, once we got that down, it was about starting to create the content. I'm sure we'll we'll jump into what some of that is. And you know, very often um, conversations around digital communications focus very much on social media, and people get obsessed by social media. Um, but very often, long form content is the poor relation of social, and social is bite size fast-paced newsfeed scrolling type content that leads you, that should lead you to something more. And very often the objection that, you know, public sector marketing pros will say is that we just don't have the time to produce long form content. But you really started at that approach, as you said, mapping messaging to audience to need. So you see the value in long form content. Was that something that you know, instinctively you had or where did that approach come from? No, I think like like anything else or anybody else in my position, you have to learn what the organization is or needs to be. And obviously I'm very lucky to work with some fantastic people who've been doing this for much longer than I have. So listening to them and figuring out what has worked and what hasn't. I guess my, my background before this and my marketing journey started with an organization called Monster Energy, which is like a Red Bull, um, a big global brand. And, and all, all of their work is focused around content delivery and content creation. So I was working on you know two-wheel and four-wheel motor and surfing and skating events around the world with them. So got a real understanding of what it is and how difficult it is to get people to buy into a brand, into a logo, to understand it. And when they do, when you get them across that journey, that that once you have them, it's much easier to to get that uh, get that messaging to them. I left there and went on to work with a PR agency in Dublin called Thinkhouse and managing clients like Heineken or Coors Light, Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, and others. You got to see what worked and what didn't work across whether it was TV or social media, radio advertising. So got a good understanding of maybe where we should stand or where we could, uh, and then looking at our audience matrix for the Western Development Commission, how we should. Uh, how we should attack that and the long form content I guess for me you know it became really important really quickly because one of our KPIs was going to be driving traction back to the Western Development Commission website how do we get more people to understand what it is that we do as an organization what's the elevator pitch and really the best way to get them to do that is, is to come back to the site and um, so those long form content the articles about living here investing here the articles about what our investment team are doing whether they land in the media or not um getting people to see them, click on them, even if it's just the first couple of lines. And as you know, building that, um, I guess, continuous engagement with them. So if they see it a couple of times a week, whether it's online or somewhere else, that they that they do get an understanding when you meet them, what does the Western Development Commission do? They go, oh, yeah, I saw that article last week and another article the week before. I do have an understanding of what it is. And that, it's almost like chipping away over time, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I have seen the content and this is why I asked you to be a guest on the show. Um, I've, followed the organization for many years, but I've definitely noticed the change. And no matter where I go on social, I am presented with a conversation or a story. Um, and I'm really engaged in it because I've I've business in the West of Ireland. I'm from here. I'm a huge advocate for it. Um, and so I can see that it, I don't see your metrics, obviously, but I can see that it does engage me as a potential Audience. Well, that's obviously, obviously news in my ears. That's fantastic. And, and um, you know, the last thing I want to do is come 
come on and preach that we've got everything sorted. We don't. Anybody, I think, or I hope, in content creation and marketing, it's a learning curve. You have to be on the ball. You have to continuously keep at it. And we have a long way to go, I would think. We rebranded and launched last August, so we're not even a year really into that new brand. And we're now looking back to see what performed well, what didn't, what should we be producing going forward for the next 12 months, two years, three years, and so on and so forth. So, you know, just because we created something last year, if it didn't perform particularly well, we need to relook at it, maybe redo it, change it. And um, I listened to a podcast last night, Melda May talking about how she creates albums and how they re-listen to maybe a guitar solo 60 or 80 times before they decided on which one. Sometimes I feel like content creation is that. You could be, you know, pernickety about a couple of seconds in a video or a couple of seconds in in, um, in a podcast or a few lines in an article, and that's what can change it. That's what can make it engaging, whether it's the headline or a few lines or, you know, the opening scene in a video. That's what grabs people. And um, I think that's what myself and, and my team are doing at the moment is we're we're trying where possible anything that goes out to really um, make sure it's best in class for what we're doing. So let's talk about those long form content pieces. Let's start with the articles and those stories about people who have ventured West or who have evolved and blossomed West. Um, where, where have they gone? How have they performed? And what's been the reaction? I guess we're looking in a way when I took this role the backdrop of, of my job is the West of Ireland. So if you look at it from a product perspective and trying to sell it, you couldn't have a better product anywhere in the world. Um, if you ask me to sell a, a pair of shoes with the same um, you know, love and aspiration, it's, it's, it'd be impossible. It's because you've got the backdrop. And the backdrop isn't just the rivers, the mountains, the lakes, the surf, it's the people, it's the community, it's the energy that you feel when you go to these towns. So first of all, when we went looking for those stories, there are hundreds of thousands of them so you know you're not going to run out of content quickly um, and it's about you know picking the ones that are going to be um i guess achievable for people and that if, if you're on a dublin bus which i did for years flicking through your phone and you see an article and you know it's it, it means something to you and, and you get that um you get the feels as, as you say um those are the stories we were trying to put out first and i guess they were to replace what was done on Look West to live under the living section, or what we call it, on the new website. Um, and they are one of the most viewed pages. I think the last time I looked yesterday on our Google Analytics, they were number two on Google Analytics for the last month. So something that people are finding pretty quickly. And I guess, um, you know, if you Google living in the West of Ireland, finding a job in Roscommon, um, how do I move to County Clare? We are consistently at the moment still the first pages that come up from a Google uh, search engine perspective. So when people find it, they're then staying. And that that was something we were, uh, I guess, hoping or aspiring to change from maybe some of the older analytics that we had. People were finding the site, but maybe not spending as long. The dwell time was, was an awful lot less. Now we're finding those 250 to 350 word articles with good imagery um, and kind of you know good snippets of content, people are spending five, six, seven minutes reading them and even coming back again to read them. And then the other articles that are linked to those are the specific county stories. So trying to keep the stats up to date on housing, on childcare, on jobs that are available in the region. So again, people are finding those pretty quickly and spending quite a lot of time on them, which is which is great. And then you ventured into the world of podcasting. And we know that podcasting is a growing medium and yes. Perhaps you are an early adopter in the public sector scene. What was the inspiration for launching a podcast? Well, it's interesting because I think we probably launched a podcast around the same time that every man and his dog launched a podcast in the world. Um, but it was in the hopper for, for quite a while. And I guess when I joined, uh, our CEO is a gentleman called Tomas Shiakon, very forward-thinking uh, gentleman. And um, he's an ex-broadcaster, so he's a, a broadcast background with TG Carr and RTE. And I wanted to make sure we, we tapped into that because you don't always have that um, – you don't always have that asset as a CEO in an organization. So when we pitched the idea to him of doing podcasts, absolutely no problem at all, he said. And then it was really about, okay, well, what's the story we want to tell here? Um, and for us, from a government perspective, uh, trying to showcase that we could push the bar out a little bit and, and quickly, that I didn't need two or three or four years in this role before we started looking at those bigger pieces of the jigsaw. Uh, and again, the way I pitched it to our board and to see and to the CEO tomorrow was that look, let's try it. Let's try six or eight episodes. Let's see what the metrics are like. See if we're if we're gaining the traction that we need. And really looking at those audience, the audience for that 
um, we were looking at the county councils, the chambers, the main stakeholders in the region to really get the message out there that one, the Western Development Commission understands what's happening across the board from a blanket perspective, um, but also that we're here to support and here to help and, and here for you to be a voice. So those six podcast episodes that we've put out so far have ranged from um, talking about remote working, which is obviously something we're, we're, we're working very closely with on, on the government and the government strategy, to um, the carbon agenda, to um, scaling up your business and starting up a business. And then the last one was was very much focused on attracting talent, which is a, a big piece of a jigsaw for us at the moment. How do we attract key talent to, to live and work and stay in the region? And again, they, 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 they've absolutely outperformed what we were expecting to do from a metric perspective. Um, not without its own challenges. I think, you know, for us, the, the challenge of a podcast is you can create a good piece of content. It can live across all platforms from Spotify to Apple and everything else. And you can post it on social, but it doesn't always necessarily get traction quickly. So what myself and Emma and Karen have been looking really closely at is, well, what are other companies across the world doing from a podcast um, perspective to make sure the people that we want to see it are seeing it? And at times, I try to avoid where I can spending and spending and spending because if you're consistently spending across social to reach people, you're losing. Um, really, if, if, they, if they're looking for your content or if they should be reading it, they should be able to find it easier than that. So it's not something we've 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 cracked completely yet. And I think it's something we'll continuously work on as we put podcasts out there. But even uh, organically, the podcasts have have um, definitely outdone what we were expecting them to do. So I love to hear you say that um, you're in it for the long game because long form content is about the long game. Social is the here and now and the short game but you really want to go far. You don't necessarily want to go fast. Was there that level of patience within your organization to give you time to grow those metrics with a long game in mind? The patience is probably on my side, the lack of it. Um, yes and no. I think um, the difference for me stepping into this organization, they've been doing fantastic work for a very long time, but maybe not necessarily talking about it openly. So we didn't have social channels from Western Development Commission side. We weren't... Um, reactive in what we were putting out to, to the press, really. Um, if we got mentioned in the press, it was positive. But so so joining the organization, I was trying to instigate an awful lot of change very quickly. Uh, and that can't or isn't always easy. Um, but the team, especially the management team uh, and across the board, they were they were they were very quick to to jump on board with what we were hoping to do. I don't think they maybe understood how quick I wanted to do it. So rebranding Pushing out video content, podcasts, long term, you know, long form content within a few few months of joining was probably a stretch beyond what they expected. And um, my patience sometimes can be a bit more difficult because I'm looking at, I guess, our sister agencies out there, IDA Ireland, who've been doing it for seventy years, Enterprise Ireland, who've been doing it for almost just almost as long, and if you stop the man in the street and ask what either of those agencies do, you'll get some form of an answer. The Western Development Commission has has quite a while away to go until we're there, but I do think within our stakeholder and peer group, where we've definitely made um, we've made a, a lot of movement in the last probably twelve to thirteen months on that. So I'll tell you a story. Twenty years ago, I would have covered the Western Development Commission as a broadcast journalist in Highland Radio in Donegal, and to see how you've evolved two decades later, and to remain relevant, and actually to be at the front of perhaps the public sector comms. Um, well, that's right, lovely to hear. Thank you. <laughs> I hope in terms of digital comms is great and um, because if you're trying to attract young talent and you're trying to be the voice of living in the west then you have to be representative of what you're promising that audience that are watching but let's talk about video content um of course again with the product there's no shortage of amazing drone footage where you can take us across yep. strandville beach or downings in my own home county um, and again, video can be seen as a type of content that is, you know, difficult, it's expensive if you want high quality. But do you use video in other ways apart from just those kind of uh, big aerial shots and helicopter shots? Yes, uh, and we've got lots more coming down the track. So I'm I'm a big advocate for, for video content. And I, I think that probably comes from my, my agency days. Um, if you were trying to launch a product uh, or rebrand or, uh, you know, I remember relaunching the the O2 Arena at the time and working on the video content and and, and map uh, projection mapping on it. Um, I'm always an advocate for people are busy. People are really busy, and 
you know, as relevant as you are to your to your cohort, whoever they are, video is a really quick way without sound or with sound to reach them, either on phone or on laptop. So, um, I, I, and I also, I think I really enjoy being part of video projects. It's just something that um, from, from my early stages working with Monster Energy and I was doing videos once a week on something globally, um, you know, being offered the chance to do that for the West of Ireland is a gift because, Yes, the, the, the landscape is beautiful, like we spoke about a few moments ago, but also from an industry perspective and what we're trying to talk about at the moment, whether it's living here, or working here, investing here, or moving here, there's there's just countless, countless stories. So, you know, I spend a good portion of my weeks speaking to industry across the region um, about what they're doing, the challenges that they're facing at the moment, and how we can support that. So you've probably heard Tomas, our, our CEO, he's on the board of Grow Remote, talking about remote working and the benefits of it, how that can help to rejuvenate the region. And um, We've obviously got some content that's been posted out on that. We're working on um, the Hubs project that I mentioned a while ago. So that's to uh, connect all of the co-working spaces and the Hubs uh, nationally, now actually across the country. And I've got a video team, or we have a video team out this week shooting um, for a new uh, video piece on that which I'm really excited about and we also have a separate video team shooting Vox Pop videos across the country so so interviews but again if you were to look at a different opportunity or a different way of getting that content across sometimes the long form just doesn't work because it ends up being long long form you know they could be seven or eight eight hundred word articles that people just won't watch or, or read um, so to answer your question the visuals are fantastic, but we are trying to step into, to, I guess, the broader, uh, wider messages. So we're, we're working on, for example, a six-part TV series with TG Cahar at the moment. Um, and that's starting to be produced in two weeks' time with our Galway episode. So essentially, we're going to have six, six parts, uh, one county for each one. And in each one, we're going to tell a story of somebody who's moved to the west of Ireland, trying to find a good balance of people who work for FDI, Enterprise Ireland clients who maybe work with Uderos or work with ourselves so that it gives the full scope of what's happening. Um, and like, you know, within that, you, you find real life stories, why they moved here, whether it's to be you know closer to schools, cheaper cost of living, better work-life balance. But you can also pepper in the companies that they're working for and the great innovation that, that's happening within the region already. And I think that's not something that's always been spoken about. Uh, for a long time, the idea of moving to the West or back to the West of Ireland, people may have thought your your career would have to take a step back or you wouldn't have an opportunity to, to you know, get take a senior manager position or a CEO position. That's absolutely changed now. There are hundreds and hundreds of companies offering really good salary rates, really good jobs across the region. So that TG Car series will showcase those people, but we're also going to pepper it with those key stakeholders in the region who will get across the key messages about why Sligo, Donegal, Clare, um, Roscommon and so on are, are fantastic places to live. So that'll go out on TG, TG Car, go out on the... Um, on their player as well. And then we'll obviously push it out on social media. So I guess it's a, a step in a different direction from a video content production because there'll be 45 minute um, pieces. And, and I'd hope that the first one is so successful. This is my aim that we'll be able to go straight into a production of a, of a second series. Well, you're starting with Galway, so that's not bad. But obviously, no. you know, if, if Donegal was first, that would also be great. Um, <laughs> I'll definitely tune in. And actually, I can testify to you know, living and working in the West of Ireland. My latest student that registered over the weekend was from South Australia to take wow. one of my courses. So me being here, it doesn't matter that I'm based here and I've got the sea. I was like training at seven o'clock this morning on Silver Strand Beach. Wow. I was, did the school run and I was here at my desk at nine o'clock. So that sense of vitality in every sense of the world from economic, emotional well-being and um, quality of life is brilliant. But talk to me about the ROI of content marketing. Um, you mentioned, you know, putting all your money into social. Um, it can be a drain. And, and I know this, the social networks know when you've got deep pockets. And if they know you've got deep pockets, yeah, keep asking. they'll go and reach for more. Yes. So would you say there's a good return on, on investment of public money in content marketing? Content marketing, yes. Uh, paid social advertising, I'm not convinced, if I'm honest. Um, I mentioned I used to work in agency days and we spent, you know, a couple of years building up Facebook pages or Twitter pages for, you know, big brands. And then all of a sudden we were turning around telling them, well, now you've got to pay to reach that audience. So I was there, I guess, during that turn of the clock when social media agencies, they knew what was coming. Uh, but but I, don't, I don't necessarily think that, that the agencies uh, understood that. Um, spending money on content creation for us 
is absolutely money well spent. And, and when I joined, I obviously had to advocate for a budget because it wasn't there uh, from a comms perspective. My CEO was very amenable and we work very closely on everything that we do. Um, I, I, I can't look back on anything we've done over the last year to say that that could have been money well spent because I, I'm I'm very careful about how we spend it. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm trying to spend my own money. Um, obviously, everything we do has to go to tender, which is a challenge from a government perspective. So three quotes, and, and in most instances, it's more. And then with the quotes, you go through them with a fine tooth comb to see, um, you know, what's working and, what, and what's not. Um, you know, so for example, with our video production last year, we worked with a company called uh, Moose, based in Galway, and you know, very affordable, fantastic team, best in class, best in best in West Ireland. But they wanted to do it. You know, they wanted to tell this story, and that's the agencies or content producers. When it can't be done in house, uh, we might get to that in a moment. And um, you you need to, or we try where we can to find agencies to work with us that also see the benefit of it, because either they're based in the West or they'd see the reason why we're trying to tell that story. Because if they're not, um you can pretty quickly burn money and you you can you can also spend an awful lot of your time managing or or trying to manage an agency on the other side of things so let's talk about the processes content marketing and long form content is brilliant but the smart way to do it is to have a seamless process where you you map it you have the story it's hitting all the marks in terms of audience segmentation and um, you've got your metrics set down do you guys have processes that you've been able to to introduce over the past year or so with your content stuff that you're doing in-house uh, yes i guess w- what we would start with would be if we're going to create a piece of content we'd look at the audience matrix that we've built to see okay who's this built for who are we creating the content for and we've obviously built personas for each of those to say okay this is john and he works in x company in dublin he's on a bus in the morning going to work he's looking to move back to the rest of ireland or it's you know maybe somebody who's from overseas who's moved to Ireland, loves the crack, loves Guinness, loves the food, um, but maybe doesn't necessarily want to stay in Dublin long-term, wants to stay in Ireland. How do we reach those different audiences? So if we're creating a piece of content, that's where we start. Who's the audience? Where are we going to reach them? How do they digest that media? So should this be a video content? Should it be long-form content? Um, Where should it live? Is it okay just to live on our own social channels and our own website, or should we be looking to partner with somebody else? So, for example, you know, should we be looking to partner with entertainment.ie, joe.ie, or somebody else to try and reach their audience while we're at it? Or is it a press release? And if it's a press release, as you know, does that go to just the counties based in the west of Ireland, or is it a national release that goes out to all of them? What time of day does that get out? Go out with? Do we need images? Do you include the videos in a Dropbox to allow them to update it? So, yes, as I guess the the long and short answer we look at all of those before we create the content, map it out to make sure that we've 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 um, we've nailed it as much as possible. But as I said earlier, I think we're still very much in the early stages. We've been lucky but you make your own luck in, in a lot of sense um and i think we we'll learn as we go along until you're three or five years into that strategy i think it's difficult to be able to look back and see exactly and pinpoint what what went right and what went wrong so um yeah hit and miss yeah i think luck, luck is the intersection between preparation and action you know <laughs> a little bit of serendipity thrown in yeah uh, well, well the difference have- the difference for us i guess there is and we're very lucky the, the advocates across the region, when we put out good content, so if I was to use our More to Life campaign that we launched last year as an example, when we launched that, we didn't put a whole lot of money behind it in terms of, of, of social media. In fact, we put none behind it for quite a while. It went out on its own. But we did send it to a very wide, varied um, group of stakeholders, county councillors, um, chamber of commerce, FDI businesses, EI businesses, and, and give them a Dropbox link to say, you know, we've just released this campaign. The idea is to tell the story of the West of Ireland and the end goal is to attract more people to live and work and work for you. So there are thousands of people across the region, across the West, who want to see the West progress. And that's, I guess, really lucky for us because they're they're fans of the show and we're fans of their show, if that makes sense. So when we send something out, they're quite happy to post it on their social advocate for it, whether it's sharing it or sending it out themselves. And that really, at times can avoid us spending, you know, nonsense money on, on on getting it pushed across social or elsewhere from a paid media perspective. Because if you get advocates to buy into it and it gets that natural push, it also comes across as being much more natural to the people who see it. Because it doesn't look like it's it's um it's paid for. It's kind of been shoved in their face. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, that's your version of influencers, right? You yes. Have all I guess so. Influencers in their own right advocating for you. 
um, yeah, without spending any money. So what is next for the Western Development Commission? Have we any exclusives here in terms of your next uh, piece of content that we can expect? Um, you, you can tell you a few because there's, there's quite a few in the hopper. So we launched um, Western Jobs Study a couple of weeks ago, uh, and that was a platform we were working on for quite a while. Karen Sweeney, who's um, one of my colleagues, has been has been working on that for for quite a while, and that I guess stemmed from the the big question when you look at an FDI perspective. If I use that as, as an example, if a software development company comes to Donegal tomorrow and says. We really want to set up here. We love the work-life balance. We love the beaches. We believe the people who come and work for us will stay. Um, can you find me 50 software developers tomorrow? And we all say, absolutely. We know we can, and we know we all speak to those people, but there hasn't been any data to back that up. So this platform, Western Jobs, has been built to showcase the people that are looking to move to the region uh, in the next few weeks, few months, few years. So we've got three distinct audiences for that. Um, one is those job seekers looking to move from Dublin and elsewhere. Um, the second, and so my, my dog is drinking water here beside me. I'm not sure if you can hear that. Well, I've got a cat outside my... Joys of working from home. Yeah. Um, the second um, is the companies looking to set up a profile. And, uh, and the third is those stakeholders. So those stakeholders can now join the platform themselves, get their own password and log in on a daily basis and pull down that data to say, actually, as of this morning, we can see that there are X amount of software developers looking to move to Donegal and I can prove it from this platform. If you decide to set up your company here, put your job up on here and they'll all get an email to say, this job is now live. So it's trying to connect those dots between the IDA companies, the Enterprise Ireland companies, Uros, the Gilded, and our own. So, so that does, does um, I guess, synergies between us. So we did put out a, a video to launch that about two weeks ago, and that was very much focused on the Dublin audience, those that are based in Dublin and looking to move both um, from the region or, or not. And the next video that we, we have shot, it just isn't fully edited yet, is focused on the diaspora. So looking at a... a professional female uh, based overseas looking to move back who is originally from the region. And we obviously all know lots of those people. And I think the pandemic has amplified the opportunities that are now here in the West of Ireland and, and also that want to be back home. You know, there's lots of people reaching out and saying, I'm from X County, Donegal, Sligo, Clare, Roscommon, and I've been away for 10, 12, 15 years and I'd love to move back. What are the opportunities? So Western Jobs is really the starting point for that. The, the first video was focused on the Dublin audience. The second will focus on the diaspora, but we will have a, a full marketing campaign based around that. Um, so that's one piece of content. The other is the TG4 piece that I mentioned. And then I guess the other uh, is is the, the Hubs project. And that Hubs project is going to have lots of content going out around it. Firstly, focused around the different Hub users. So you have somebody working for an FDI company. You have a remote worker. You have that Wild Atlantic Way visitor who might want to come and use a Hub on a Monday or a Friday. So again, there's oodles of content that we could and, and, and will be tapping into. So we're starting with the broad messages and the idea of the initial Hubs um, campaign. It's called Transform Your Workday. So right now, I'm sitting in my kitchen. You're sitting at home by the looks of things, uh, and so are thousands of other people across the country. And there are about 400 co-working and, and, and co-working spaces and hubs across the country that are going to be open for business again in the next week. So the initial messaging around that is about, did you know that there's a hub five kilometers down the road from you? Here's a map. Here's an online booking system. So we've procured and built kind of an Airbnb booking.com for all of those hubs. So there'll be a one-stop shop. And there's a whole team working on that. And it's, it's almost ready to go. So we launch in the next couple of weeks. But... Uh, on the comm side of things, myself, Karen and Emma are working on lots of video content, lots of written content, uh, podcasts as well. That'll be all focused on that. So um, loads, loads is the answer. <laughs> so you just told me that I can go to Donegal uh, for my for two months in the summer and I can work from there and I'll be able to find myself a little hub where I can still run my business. Yeah, I, I guess th those of us that work within the hubs world and we speak to them on a daily basis, we understand what's there. But the idea that most of them have one gigabit broadband connection, there's free coffee, but also that community aspect of what's in these hubs. I think that's that's maybe what isn't what isn't known at the moment. You can go work for them, you can join events, and most of the hub managers and owners that wrap their arms around you and do everything they can to help your business progress. So we're seeing lots of companies start small from these hubs across the region and grow pretty quickly. And a lot of the reasons for that is that the community and the hub does everything they can to help them build a new site, find a software developer, to find customers, to find funding, to introduce them to whoever, you know, Enterprise Ireland, IDA, Uros or ourselves for, for funding. Um, 
that's that's what's become really important. And obviously, the big question is always around the west of Ireland is, is broadband connection. I'm lucky. I've got good broadband in my house, but everybody isn't the same. Uh, and in the meantime, while we're waiting for the national broadband plan to roll out to the, the smaller nooks and crannies across the country, and I get a lot of this from my friends in Donegal, when's it coming? When's it coming? Um, especially on the islands. I have a couple of friends living on Inch Island, for example, in Donegal. And beautiful part of the world, but their broadband isn't particularly good. And I keep saying to them, there's a hub just in the road. It's what got one gigabit broadband and all of these good things I'm talking about, free parking, free coffee, pack your laptop, go in and meet all those people. And there's a whole community waiting. So really excited about creating content and pushing that out. And again, there are 400 hubs that will become advocates to push that out and help us get that messaging across. So from our conversation so far, what I've just learned is you have buckets of owned evergreen content that creates a content loop that um, emotionally engages with your key audiences that gets that online engagement but that drives people back to your website which was your very first and ultimate goal what would you say to your colleagues in public sector and you've had a couple of jobs in public sector and private sector who are so nervous and who are reticent to take on long-form content um, because it's difficult or they don't want to insource it, they don't want to have that ownership, um, what would you say? First thing I'd say is, is pick up the phone to ring either myself or somebody else because I definitely did that. I'm, I'm a, a great believer in in, um, in learning from others that have done it before you. So while we were on the journey of the rebrand, I rang everybody in my phone book who, who works in this space to say, what do you think? Will this work? Will it not? What have you done in the past? And you take snippets from everybody so you know if i have friends that are working in pr agencies or bigger brands or whatever it's going to be don't be afraid to bounce ideas off people i think that's that's the first thing and uh, because nobody knows everything and you have to pull bits and pieces to, to 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 garner what makes what works maybe for your organization the second thing is is take a chance within reason when it comes to you know public funding and, and, and public money you know start small if you need to but a lot of this content isn't particularly expensive to create so you know we're really lucky now that we've been able to take on a few extra staff members uh, and emma for example who just joined us two and a half months ago is already writing some of that long form content for us so if you can find the right people with the right skill set and empower them to do it uh, ideally you do as much as you can in-house and this is a debate myself and my CEO have all the time in, in an ideal world you do all of this in-house but sometimes with a smaller organization like ourselves it's not possible so you have to outsource it and where you have to outsource it find people who believe in what you're doing uh, because when they believe in what you're doing they'll produce good content and it'll come across as being genuine. Love it you've insourced your story. Final question Alan what about the the thought that private sector is ahead of the game of public sector. I always love to showcase best in class. Um, I think what you guys are doing is definitely best in class. Do you think that public sector is now catching up with private sector and taking you know, an agency approach and taking a smart digital approach to what they're doing in the world of digital marketing? I think it's a, it's a good question. Well, for, firstly, thanks for even putting us anywhere near that bar because, as you know, when you're, you're you're working in a bubble, trying to make sure what you're doing is good, it's nice to hear anybody say that it's that it's positive and it's going well. So, really appreciate that. Um, I think the challenge is always going to be is is, is budget. Unfortunately, uh, if you can find good people and create content in house, it's, it's it definitely makes it easier. But the challenge, looking at anybody I know working in in, in private sector, is a you don't need to tender. So you decide you've got a good company who does things good for you. You pick up the phone and they're doing the work for you the next morning. Sometimes with us, the delay, unfortunately, is writing a tender, getting it out there, getting companies to, to come back on the brief, and and then getting the company on board and briefing them and getting going. That that delay time um, coming from private sector for me sometimes can be difficult because that could be a six-week or a month or a two-month window. Um, and then the budgets, obviously, depending on the size of the organization, you know, depending on who's in charge and who believes in comms, if you're in private sector, your, your budget can be never ending. That doesn't necessarily mean they're creating better content. It means they've got a better opportunity. But, but the difference is if you're in private sector, you're usually selling something, a service or a product. And in my case, I worked for a, a, a broadband provider for a number of years and fantastic job, fantastic people. But in the end, what you're selling is an amenity that people kind of, they need, but they don't really want to know about your brand. They're not that interested. So Sometimes you feel like no matter how good the content you're creating, people don't really buy into it. Um, whereas when you're selling something 
from our side now when it's genuine. I think people see what you're doing and, and they understand what you're doing. You know, whether it's Irish Water Safety to Western Development Commission to IDA to every other, you know, sector uh, across what we do. I think for the most part, everyone's trying to do their jobs well to help the benefit of, of Ireland Inc. to grow and to move forward. So if you're creating content, I think your customers will buy into that quicker than they would if you're trying to sell them a pair of shoes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I will keep uh, preaching the gospel that Irish people or any citizen across the world, doesn't matter what government or public sector agency it is, people actually care and people are curious and they like to be informed and they now expect it. Alan, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the public sector. Not at all. Thank, thanks for the time. I hope I've managed to to give your viewers a few a few insights that have been relevant. Um, but look, there's, there's lots more. I'm thinking of bits and pieces like our image bank that we didn't get to so we're currently creating an oh, image yeah. bank well tell us this is good because i get asked questions all the time about imagery and sharing so please tell me about this one yeah no, a great a really nice idea and actually again this came from karen sweeney my colleague so and um, the challenge as you know across the region when selling it sometimes can be having good imagery and good imagery available fault you have a fantastic image bank that you probably use but it's very much focused on the outdoor amenities green fields the sheep the rainbows that kind of um you know what fault you do and fault you do best we looked and saw a gap that there is no image bank or really free to use images for industry across the region in the west of ireland so we are currently shooting an image bank that'll be free for anyone to use whether you're in the media or based in a company across the region or anybody really advocating for why live work or invest here and there's lots like i said we have shot sligo we've shot donegal and we're moving on to leitrim now that restrictions are beginning to lift and we're moving down the rest of the the counties as quick as we can and that'll be a free to use image bank on our website so that everybody can go in create a login and download images in high res, low res for social, for billboards. Everything's been signed off. So anybody in the pictures has, has signed the waivers. And um, we have seen the images started to be used for events in the counties that they're there for or for remote working um, articles. But we believe, I guess, the more images we have on that and we'll go back and bolster that up every year that we'll start to see those images go far and wide. And again, it just adds to that picture to make it easier for people to sell the region. Wow, what a brilliant idea. So where can people find your podcast, find your website, find the Image Bank? Where are you going to direct them online? So everything's on westerndevelopment.ie and we're trying to, you know, as you can imagine, keep everything there. Now, there's, you know, there's a few hyperlinks off it. So the, the Image Bank, for example, lives on its own field once you click off it, as does Western Jobs, but they're all there on the site. So we can see what's what's redirected or not. So westerndevelopment.ie and from there, you'll find the Image Bank, you'll find the podcasts, You'll find the living stories, you'll find the videos and, and everything else we've been talking about. Fantastic. And you, of course, are on uh, LinkedIn yourself, so people can connect with you there. Absolutely. I'd welcome it. I always welcome the conversation. I think it's uh, always an interesting um, an interesting angle. You always say yes to a conversation. You never know what might come from it. So if anybody wants to reach out, please do. Brilliant. Alan, it's been a pleasure. Um, have a great day. Get some, get some outdoor fresh air in Sligo and I'll be the same in Galway later. I'm actually about to go hike a mountain. It's about that time of day. So uh, I haven't got, haven't got away from the computer yet. There's a, a lovely mountain behind me called Knock and Ray. I try to get up at least once a week. So that's where I'm going now if I can. Brilliant. Thanks a million. Okay. Thanks a lot. Take it easy. Level up your social media skills by taking our diploma in social media, plus gain an industry qualification. Use the code socialmedia20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. My free gift to you in this show is a list of 20 long form content marketing ideas. You can get that at publicsectormarketingpros.com and look for the blog post associated with this podcast. As always, I'd love you to share the episode. And if you haven't rated or reviewed the show yet on your favorite podcast platform, make sure that you do. And if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, I'd really appreciate it. I'm trying to grow the audience over there too. As always, thank you so much for your feedback on every episode. I really do read every comment and every message that I get. If you'd like to be a guest on the Public Sector Marketing Show, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can drop me an email to info at publicsectormarketingpros.com or send me a DM on Twitter at JS Tweets Digital. And I'll see you on the next episode. 
Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Public Sector Marketing Show. This episode has ended, but your digital journey can continue. Head over to publicsectormarketingpros.com to access resources and links mentioned in today's show and to connect with Joanne and her team. Until the next time, be sure to subscribe, rate and review on your favorite podcast platform.